Hawaii is a tropical paradise, a land blessed with spectacular beauty and the spirit of aloha. Dana Ireland was smart, fit, and full of life. She loved the big island of Hawaii. On Christmas Eve 1991, Dana's life was stolen. She was deliberately run over while riding her bicycle, sexually assaulted, dumped into the bushes, and left to die. A local man confessed to the murder and said two brothers helped him. The man recanted his confession, but no one believed him. It's like the start of Boy Who Cried Wolf. Once he started telling the truth, nobody gonna listen. Crime scene DNA did not match any of the three men, but all three were convicted anyway. It raises questions. Are the three convicted men innocent scapegoats? Why aren't the police pursuing the man who left his male DNA on Dana Ireland? Why was exonerating new DNA evidence locked up by court order and not given to the convicted men? Albert Ian Schweitzer was an unlikely suspect in any crime. As a teenager, he liked cars and rode his bike delivering the local newspaper. His mother worked as a victim's advocate for the Hawaii County prosecutor. Albert Ian Schweitzer was named after Dr. Albert Schweitzer, the 1952 recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. This is episode seven. On Monday, January 24th, 2000, the trial of Albert Ian Schweitzer began in the Hilo courthouse. Schweitzer was on trial for the kidnapping, sexual assault, and murder of Dana Ireland. Charlene Iboshi and Lincoln Ishida were again the prosecutors. Representing Albert Ian Schweitzer was James Biven, a 43-year-old former prosecutor from Kona. In Frank Pauline's trial, Charlene Iboshi gave the opening statement for the state. This time it was Lincoln Ishida. The prosecutor was graphic. He spoke how the evidence would show that Frank Pauline, sitting in the Schweitzer Volkswagen with Dana Ireland, attempted to avulse or bite off her nipple. <laughs> In his opening statement, the prosecutor hit hard on his critical evidence. How at the Crime Scene 2 fishing trail, the police found Frank Pauline's t-shirt drenched in Dana Ireland's blood. Thursday, January 27, 2000, was the day the prosecution connected Frank Pauline to the blue t-shirt found next to Dana Ireland. If the prosecution could prove Frank Pauline was at the crime, that would tend to corroborate his confession implicating Albert Ian Schweitzer. Lynn Matthews again testified that he was sure that the bloody blue t-shirt was the same one he and Frank Pauline had bartered over. Stephen Deering again testified that the bloody blue Jimmy Z t-shirt belonged to Frank Pauline. Schweitzer's defense attorney, James Biven, asked Deering if he was just assuming that was the shirt he saw Frank Pauline wear. Mr. Deering responded that he was not making an assumption. This was the shirt that Frank Pauline wore. In Frank Pauline's trial, Sharla Figueroa had testified that she was in shock when she saw the t-shirt on television covered in blood. I was in shock. And why were you in shock? Because that's the first time I found out that he was a suspect for this case. Charlotte Figueroa again testified that the bloody blue t-shirt belonged to Frank Pauline. Ms. Figueroa stated that she remembered Christmas Eve 1991 because it was her first Christmas with her twin boys and she got in a fight with Frank Pauline. She said Frank had worn the shirt prior to Christmas 
and the next time she saw the t-shirt it was on television news as in Frank Pauline's case John Gonzalves Frank Pauline's half-brother was called as a witness for the state the important part of his testimony was that Gonzalves connected a fourth man to the case. He testified that on Christmas Eve 1991, Frank had come home in a purple Volkswagen driven by Albert Ian Schweitzer with Sean Schweitzer and a fourth man whom he did not recognize. This comported with the prosecution's fourth attacker theory. In his closing argument, the prosecutor emphasized the importance of the testimony of John Gonzales. Gonzales had identified a fourth man as being present on Christmas Eve, implying that the lack of a DNA match was less of a problem. As it turns out, John Gonzales is the only witness to testify that there were four men in the Schweitzer car on Christmas Eve 1991. On February 3, 2000, convicted felon Michael Ortiz, the state's star witness, took the stand to repeat what Albert Ian Schweitzer had told him while they were both in the Big Island Jail. Ortiz began his testimony by saying Ian Schweitzer had told him he accidentally hit Dana Ireland while she was riding her bike. Volkswagen, he turned around just to scare him, but the Volkswagen slid in the gravel and hit the back of her tire, and she flew off the bike. You are looking at page 15 of the official transcript of Michael Ortiz testifying in the Albert Ian Schweitzer trial. Ortiz testified that after Dana was knocked off her bike, Frank Pauline yanked her by the hair and a bunch of her hair came out. The jury already knew that a clump of Dana Ireland's hair was found on the road at crime scene one. The clump of hair found on the road was never public information. The inference from this circumstantial evidence was that Michael Ortiz must have heard this from someone who was at the crime. This was corroboration that Albert Ian Schweitzer must have confessed to Michael Ortiz. And if Albert Ian Schweitzer knew about the clump of hair, he must have been there. This is powerful evidence that validated the testimony of Michael Ortiz. Based upon our common sense and experience, we can infer that Michael Ortiz was telling the truth when he said that Ian Schweitzer confessed to him and that Schweitzer was a participant in the murder. You're looking at page 16 of the Michael Ortiz transcript. Ortiz also testified that Schweitzer had told him that he saw Frank Pauline rip Dana Ireland's shirt off and bite her on the breast. The bite mark was information that had never been made public. The jury knew about the vicious bite mark from Prosecutor Lincoln Ishida's opening statement about the avulsing of the nipple. The Ortiz bite mark testimony was corroboration that Albert Ian Schweitzer confessed to Michael Ortiz. If Schweitzer knew about the bite mark, he must have been there. This is powerful circumstantial evidence that validated the testimony of Michael Ortiz. Based upon our common sense and experience, we can infer that Albert Ian Schweitzer confessed to Michael Ortiz and that he was a participant in the murder of Dana Ireland. Anything is possible. Maybe Frank Pauline did pull her hair out, but is it probable? The trial experts testified that Dana Ireland was run over by the killer's vehicle. She had motor oil or grease on her calf, severe abrasions over much of her body, a broken collarbone, and a pelvis broken in two places and a punctured bladder. She had a large gash on her head, exposing her skull. Judges for Justice believes that the clump of Dana Ireland's hair 
was detached during the time she was dragged under the killer's motor vehicle. Here we see the debris path of Dana Ireland being run over. Dana Ireland's wristwatch is on the ground because the strap was torn. Her hair on the road because her head was gashed, exposing her skull. Her left tennis shoe was torn off her foot. Michael Ortiz's story about Frank Pauline yanking Dana's hair out is illogical. It does not fit the evidence. And maybe Frank Pauline did bite Dana Ireland on the breast. But that is contrary to the evidence. We know that in 1994, a nationally recognized forensic dentist, Dr. Norman Sperber, eliminated Frank Pauline and the Schweitzer brothers as the source of the bite mark on Dana Ireland. There's one more point about Michael Ortiz. On February 4, 1997, Ortiz was sentenced after being found guilty of felony theft. Judge Ricky Mayamano gave Michael Wayne Ortiz an extended term sentence, much longer than the standard sentence. He was sentenced to a minimum of three years and four months to a maximum of 10 years. This is a page from the appeal of Michael Ortiz, a 1999 decision by the Hawaii Supreme Court. We see that Judge Amano told Ortiz in 1997, as far as I'm concerned, you are a menace to the community that you live in. You are a menace to society. You devoted your life to a pursuit of financial and material gain through crime. Then the judge concluded that an extended term of imprisonment was necessary for the protection of the public. Michael Ortiz agreed to testify for the state against Albert Ian Schweitzer in May 1999. Two months later, in July, he was released from prison, serving only 36 months. This was four months short of his mandatory minimum sentence and seven years short of his 10-year maximum sentence. What we know for sure is that Michael Ortiz's testimony about the bite mark being made by Frank Pauline is contrary to the evidence. We know the clump of Dana's hair on the road was probably because she was dragged underneath the killer's vehicle. We know that a judge told Ortiz in 1997 you're a menace to society. We know that Michael Ortiz got released from prison two months after he agreed to testify against Albert Ian Schweitzer. And his release from custody was at least four months short of his mandatory minimum sentence. Judges for Justice believes that Michael Ortiz lied when he claimed Albert Ian Schweitzer confessed to him. Closing arguments in the Albert Ian Schweitzer trial began on Valentine's Day, February 14, 2000. Lincoln Ishida argued for the state of Hawaii. James Biven argued for the defendant. In a criminal case, the prosecution goes first in closing because they have the burden of proof. Lincoln Ishida's confidence waned in his closing argument. During a break before the defense argument, Ishida said, Quote, I started with the emotions, but the jurors weren't reacting, so I decided to switch to the facts. Then I realized, fuck, we don't have the facts. End quote. Later, Ashita said he meant it as a joke. During the defense closing argument, Ashita's confidence would wane even more. James Bevan, a former prosecutor himself, gave an organized and powerful closing argument on behalf of his client, Albert Ian Schweitzer. He highlighted that the entire case against his client was based upon the word of a drug dealer, John Gonzales, and a thief, Michael Ortiz. He noted the scientific evidence and the evidence on the ground did not support the prosecution's case. These accusations are not corroborated by the scientific evidence, are not supported by the evidence on the ground. 
James Bevan challenged the testimony of John Gonzalez. He pointed out that of all the prosecution witnesses, Gonzalez was the only one who places a fourth man with Frank, Ian, and Sean on Christmas Eve, 1991. He stated, the prosecution needs a fourth person because in order to convict Ian of the charges, whose DNA is it? It's not Ian's, it's not Sean's, it's not Frank Pauline's. In his closing argument, Biven pointed out that Detective Guillermo had said they had discovered that five to six other people had similar blue Jimmy Z t-shirts. Biven forcefully argued that the scientific evidence has no motive, has no bias, and doesn't make deals with the prosecution. Biven said, the prosecution did not find the clues in this case on the ground or in the scientific laboratory. They found the evidence in prison and in jail. What's wrong with that kind of justice? When the time for Lincoln Ashita's rebuttal argument came, he was loaded for bear. He finished strong. Defense attorney James Biven had hit hard on the scientific evidence. DNA tests had eliminated and excluded Frank Pauline, Albert Ian Schweitzer, or Sean Schweitzer as the donor of the sperm left on Dana, Ireland. Lincoln Ashita's rebuttal brilliantly turned the DNA evidence against the defense. He turned his biggest liability into his biggest asset. Reading from the transcript, quote, Ladies and gentlemen, we are not afraid of this evidence. We embrace it. It's that same DNA technology which places Dana Ireland's blood on Frank Pauline's t-shirt. It's the very same technology. We're not afraid of it. It's part of our case." End quote. On February 15, 2000, at 1.30 p.m., the jury forewoman informed the judge they had arrived at a verdict. We, the jury in this case, find the defendant guilty of the offense of murder in the second degree. The jury found the defendant, Albert Ian Schweitzer, guilty of kidnapping, sexual assault, and murder in the second degree. On January 29, 2004, the Supreme Court of Hawaii denied the appeal of Albert Ian Schweitzer. The court's decision in the Frank Pauline case was 61 pages long. The brevity of the court's decision in the Albert Ian Schweitzer case was conspicuous by comparison. It was only a few pages. And just like the Pauline case, the court did not address the problem of a lack of a DNA match, nor did the court discuss the fourth suspect that the state had relied on. This ends episode seven. Question, why would the Hawaii Supreme Court fail to mention the male DNA left at the crime did not match any of the three defendants? The answer may be in the Sean Schweitzer plea deal. In episode eight, we'll see that Sean cuts a deal with the prosecutor, confesses, and is released from custody.